great to be here and great to see you all. And yeah, it's, I think it's, we've had a great couple of sessions. We have, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And today we're going to, it's James. Let me just check it. Yeah. yeah, it's on. Yeah. Yep. Is it better? All right, sure. Yep, so today we're going to be talking about empowering Azure developers with OpenAI, uh, building intelligent tools. So uh, just uh, wanted to get a bit of a show of hands. Uh, who here is the already using OpenAI, uh, Azure OpenAI in particular? Right? Only one? Who here has already been using um, GPT in particular for uh, yeah, models in general? One, two, three, four. OK, quite a number of people. So if you're here, you probably want to learn more about understanding how we can leverage these tools better to be able to integrate into our CI CD pipelines, as we already saw in the description as well of the talk. Or you might want to pretty much just learn more about OpenAI use cases. and there's a number of things that we can really do with OpenAI, especially with its integration with Azure right now, or directly through the GPT integration too. So today we're going to be talking about actually both of those use cases at the same time. So pretty much OpenAI within Azure itself, and also being able to use the GPT models directly from, uh, well, OpenAI directly. So uh, just a bit of introduction about myself. Um, I'm a software engineer. Um, Currently, I uh, hold certification for AWS and also 22 Microsoft Azure certifications. I'm also the organizer of the Melbourne Python Meetup, so just flew in this morning uh, for uh, yep, like the summit. So really um, stoked about it. Really great to be in Sydney again after a while. And um, yeah, pretty much also uh, been doing this, uh, being an Israel speaker for uh, about 40 plus events and conferences now. So been doing this for a while too. And uh, I'm also an author and an instructor, uh, instructor on uh, some Udemy courses and also pretty much like an author of uh, some books as well. Uh, and pretty much I'm an also a big enthusiast for all things cloud, open source testing and virtual reality. So if you love any of those things as well, aside from the talk as well, feel free to yeah, catch me after this and we can have a chat about that. So what's the agenda going to look like for today? We're really going to be looking at, first, the introduction of uh, understanding a bit about how we can utilize these within our workflows and pretty much integrate OpenAI into our workflows, CICD pipelines, and really understand more about the use cases. We'll also look more about the confluence of Azure and OpenAI uh, and understand a bit more about how they work within uh, and pretty much help out with being able to integrate together to be able to build appropriate solutions. We'll then start looking into building AI-driven DevOps solutions. We'll look at three different use cases, which we can actually use this directly. We're going to be looking at how we can integrate AI as well in terms of open AI for the development workflow, software development workflow. And after that, we're going to be looking at future initiatives and what we can develop from there. So let's start with talking a bit about the introduction to AI-powered DevOps, where we will talk a bit about how we can navigate the future. So to start off with, we really need to talk about why we want to actually have such a talk and have such a discussion on being able to integrate into pipelines. Well, first of all, it's because we want to be able to learn how we can empower developers with OpenAI. Because OpenAI is a very big thing. And you definitely are using it for different workloads, at least the GPT models for those who are already using it for different cases within their workflows, whether it be for question answering, whether it be for, well, just in general serving as a chatbot. But there's a lot of things that we actually can get out of this more than just that. It can parse different things that we pretty much might not think about day to day, and it can make our life easier. And that's what we really want to get out of this particular discussion. And that leads us to the need to drive AI-driven enhancements, DevOps enhancements in particular, because we want to be able to learn how we can automate specific deployments and learn how we can better manage them appropriately. We also want to discuss more about Azure's infrastructure, open AI capabilities, understand its limitations, understand where it's able to stem from, and also understand what we can get out of the integration that we can do with Azure in particular. So 
what does it look like in terms of Azure for developers? Well, we have a few things. So firstly, uh, we have Azure DevOps, and we're going to be talking about these three in particular throughout the talk too, because th those are the tools that we're going to be referring to after this. But Azure DevOps, which is basically, as you probably already know, which is a complete suite of C for CID, CD pipelines, guides you through the process, helps you deploy your code up to production, Kubernetes service, which pretty much simplifies container management, and Azure monitoring, so we can provide real-time monitoring for our applications. And that brings us also to talking a bit about the confluence of Azure and OpenAI. To understand a bit more about how it's able to integrate into the ecosystem, and how it's able to help you be more productive. So OpenAI's GPT in depth in particular includes use cases such as language understanding, uh, being able to uh, generate code. And you might have already been generating some of code yourself too, helping out with different kinds of flows. And I believe that some of the talks earlier too, such as Regina's talk was also talking about how it was helping in being able to uh, help you generate repetitive code, for instance, like with Copilot. So there are a lot of tools in Azure that helps you do this. And some applications include being able to automate routine programming tasks. So as mentioned before, so being able to enhance your coding efficiency, build on productivity, and in general, just being able to help enhance your day-to-day -day workflows. And aside from that, you can also integrate into things such as customer service bots as well. So with them both, you can create a powerful duo because you pretty much are able to integrate 3.5 and 4 into different workflows. One of the workflows that we'll be also talking about, which is very much usable by a lot of different workflows that people build with usually is with Azure Functions in particular for smart DevOps automation. So being able to further build on the current automation process that you have, build all the CID, CD process, so it's pretty much very degradable, and that's why we also have Azure Functions as well. And we also want to be able to bring in the real world application, which in this case, we'll be bringing in with AI-driven predictive analytics within Azure DevOps. Now, let's get into the fun part, which is in the building of the AI-driven DevOps solutions itself. So in particular, there's going to be three main cases that we'll be looking at uh, in this section. And these are going to be integrating with Azure DevOps pipelines to be able to predict and alert on potential deployment failures before they occur. And aside from that, we're going to be looking a bit into a bot that can understand natural language to understand and automatically resolve common issues that are reported on project repositories or DevOps boards. So if you're someone who manages incidents, uh, being on call or anything like that, one of the things that you often face in day to day is pretty much being able to respond to these kinds of issues and being able to type up the resolutions. And you know, sometimes like you wake up at 5 a.m., you get a pager, and next thing you know, you, you don't want to go through a whole process of being able needing to be able to write out everything again pretty much at 5 a.m. after you solve an issue. So being able to have a bot that can actually understand what you're trying to resolve and write the appropriate resolution for you really helps to streamline this work. Aside from that, we'll be also talking a bit about capabilities within real-time code review and optimizing suggestions, both on the ID and Azure. So as you can see, there's a wide-ranging use case of being able to implement these tools. And what I'm going to be talking about these tools in particular is I'm going to be approaching this in a very traditional DevOps sense and a very traditional developer sense. So I'm going to be showing how to implement these tools uh, locally and also based on Azure itself as well. So to start off with, let's talk about revolutionizing CICD with AI in particular. So one case study that I would like to pose in particular in this one is in predicting CI pipeline failures with GP 3.5. Now, we don't necessarily have to go with GP 3.5, but in the interest of the experimentation that I conducted, it was based on 3.5. So what we really want to get out of this is being able to better the experience by being able to alert users and other people that are monitoring the pipeline based on failures. So you don't necessarily always need to 
pretty much expect uh, manually monitor it and instead have failures be able to be analyzed ahead of time in the workflow and hence alert you based on that. And the outcome from this is being able to have reduced build failures and have accelerated develop deployment cycles, which I think every developer really enjoys. So as part of this, we want to build an AI part DevOps assistant. So some of the things that we want to be able to consider in this case is what do we want to plan for when we talk about building an AI part DevOps assistant? Well, we want to be able to plan the specific features. And in this case, we want it to be able to be uh, automated alerts. So things that you can pretty much like get on go without ha fearing the pipelines breaking in the middle or such like that. And coding suggestions, being able to have specific suggestions on how you can fix things and how you can uh, particularly mitigate certain errors and task automation that is done throughout the process. And this can be implemented through integrating uh, with uh, Azure DevOps. And uh, mind you, there's a lot of approaches that we can do this. The particular approach that I'll take a look at is going to be via Azure Logic Apps in particular. So it's going to be via trigger mechanism. And we're going to be looking at that and the code associated with that in a bit. And we're going to be looking also at the impact that this has within enhanced productivity and being able to reduce the manual tasks that are expected. So an example code uh, that pretty clearly. So mind you, some things that you might notice is that some of the values are hard coded. In this case scenario, I am hard coding these to give an example of values to be able to explain these easier. Uh, in practice, as you probably know as well as engineers, please do not hard code these kinds of values into your uh, code. Please, yeah, make sure that you are securing it properly. But this these are just an example. But yeah, at, in reality, you would pretty much like put this in a secret storage or such. But to give an example uh, of what we're going to talk about pretty much. This is an example of how we would start off with coding up an expanded like AI part assistance for uh, Azure DevOps type pipelines. So in this case, we're pretty much going to be using a few components. Uh, this is coded up in Python. So what we're going to be looking at is being able to get the uh, DevOps connection library to start off with. We're then going to be looking at getting the authentication library. And this is pretty much going to let us start the authentication mechanism and be able to get us into using DevOps pipelines in particular. We then want to, so I believe that these pretty much are usually boilerplate in being able to uh, authenticate with uh, the logic app and such. And what I want to focus here though, is being able to create the function to be able to predict the failures. So in this case scenario, we want to be able to use OpenAI to predict potential failures based on deployment data, uh, and pretty much be able to predict based on the response. So uh, what we want to do is that we want to create this and pretty much have an alert that is done based on this. So we basically then uh, have them be able to detect if it's a failure or not based on data that is ingested, uh, deployment data that is ingested based on the CI/CD pipeline. So pretty much if there is one that is detected based on what is already analyzed, so. Uh, keep in mind that pretty much the deployment data in this case is pretty much the configuration and the, the results that are posed by the CI/CD, and pretty much that's what we're going to continue ingesting here to be able to uh, detect if there's potential failures. And accordingly, we'll uh, put uh, execute the alert function basically from um, to be able to based on the deployment data. And the alert function will pretty much just be similar to this. We'll replace the address team, uh, email address accordingly. We will pretty much use it, uh, have the deployment data declared here, for instance. And again, usually pretty much we would, uh, in a production workflow, this will be fed into the code directly from uh, your CICD workflow directly. Uh, might be also from the trigger mechanism, but in this case, we're just pretty much just showing how the data would be fed in. But basically, based on that, we're then executing the predict deployment failure and using it based on the deployment data that has been uh, put in. And that way, the email will be delivered to the specific uh, email address that we are putting through. And this way, we're essentially putting through the response and basically just showing if the 
alert is sent successfully or if there's a failure within sending the email alert. So going back to that, we also have uh, looking into enhancing code reviews with AI. And there's a few things that we can look into this in particular. So there's a number of approaches that we can really get out of uh, Azure. Some of them are already implemented within on the go, which is such as with the discussions within using Copilot. Some of them are can be also be obtained from third party services. And there's a number of great extensions that are integrated into um, Azure in particular. Like one of them, for instance, that I was uh, looking at as well in particular was one uh, pretty much such as an extension that adds an extra step on the CI CD pipeline that pretty much adds on an uh, extra PR uh, step basically that allows the AI to analyze the step before then going on to being able to be reviewed by a human. Because at the end of the day, we still need to keep the human in the loop while being able to have AI to filter out the potential errors ahead of time. So we can achieve this through different ways. So uh, as mentioned, there are GPT-3 or some of them four as well, part extensions for real-time coding advice in uh, Azure's IDEs. Uh, aside from that, you can also uh, have uh, coding standards enforcement, bug detection, performance optimization tips. So these can also be trained on your own data as well. And I'll, I'll be talking about that in a bit as well, but. Fine tuning is a very important approach as well. If you uh, do want more sophisticated performance from your particular GPT models to be able to be trained on your own data and then pretty much abide by your standards. So that's one thing. And pretty much this brings the capability of being able to provide good quality for your code and also good educational feedback for developers while building a culture of continued implementation because if we are enhancing the code reviews from this cycle those who are new to the company for instance or those who might be still uh, junior staff can easily get familiarized with how things are done and pretty much learn on the go while having the senior devs focus on uh, pretty much the, the main stuff but also still keep being able to learn from uh, code quality as well uh, based on the ai aside from that there's a number of things that we can also get from working with uh, Copilot in particular in, in this sense. For instance, yeah, with, with being able to help write code, writing an additional step within the CI CD pipeline to check PRs. Uh, and if you've already used uh, models such as GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, you already probably might have already tried to insert piece of code. Say, for instance, try to review the code or, for instance, try to expand on the code, build certain functions. and Probably the same case as well if you try to be able to utilize Copilot to be able to build on your code and extend it to. So there's a number of things that we can really work with Copilot for to be able to provide for Azure DevOps. And there's also Azure DevOps as well, of course. Um, I believe that, yeah, the feature currently is still under preview at the moment, uh, Copilot for Azure DevOps, but it certainly also is a great tool for helping make such coding suggestions easier and helping to resolve potential issues as well as you go along with your Azure DevOps development as you develop your CI CD pipelines. And of course, one of the biggest other use cases is of uh, GPT models in particular with OpenAI is being able to leverage AI for monitoring Azure deployments and being able to provide operational health based on that. So uh, using Azure Application Insights and GPT for anomaly detection, uh, diagnostics, uh, which in general just provides a lot of uh, benefits in terms of, for instance, being able to have practice issue resolution and performance optimization. So this is an example of one such implementation of uh, having a bot to automate issue resolution. And this was something that I also and implementing from a hardcore's perspective as well for the purposes of this particular demo. So in this case, what I really want to focus on though is I want to show the authentication mechanism and pretty much how we are establishing the particular connection based on this. So we're using the text analytics client in this case, we're initializing it, we are establishing the connection and we're basically going to be using this to be able to help 
resolve issues and connect to Azure board later on. But this is the crux of it, because we then want to declare a function as well uh, based on resolve issues where we feed in the issue description and the work item ID. And based on that, we want to feed in the issue description as part of the documents and basically initialize this as part of the documents and from that, perform uh, analyze uh, sentiment uh, from using the text analytics client. So we can see here that we are also handling the particular error, if there's any. And we're going to be, in this case, using the GPT 3.5 Turbo to be able to uh, complete the chat and pretty much uh, with the com command uh, generate a resolution for an issue with the particular uh, issue, basically. And we're putting in the issue description. So we're not consuming too many tokens in this case scenario. We're only consuming 100 because usually issue resolutions don't need too much. Uh, it might differ, of course, from your own use case, depending on your use case and how much you also want for uh, in general for the issue to be resolved, how many tokens you want to consume. And we're pretty much just stripping the uh, message as well to be able to get the uh, appropriate message. And we then execute the automate resolution function to be able to then feed in the resolution and the work item ID uh, based on your uh, Azure board. We then continue on to automating the resolution through uh, this particular function. So uh, we are then getting the uh, working client, so a working item tracking client. Uh, so we're doing this by going initializing the connection.clients get work item tracking client. And we're then initializing it. And we are feeding in the documents uh, in this array through being able to use the JSON patch operation command. So through this, we are adding this array of operations. And in this case scenario, we're adding in the fields system history. This is pretty much feeding into the Azure boards. And what we then do is that we are adding in the value of the automated resolution suggestion and with the resolution. So we're going to be seeing a quick demo as well in a bit of how this would look like as well from uh, executing this command uh, into then being able to be visualizing this command via the uh, Azure boards, for instance. And we're then putting updating the state of the field of the uh, particular work item to done. So Appropriately from here, we're then updating the work item from, uh, from here. Uh, we're just basically pushing in what we currently already have. And we're then basically just printing in some diagnostics uh, information so that we can also see this in progress. So in this example usage, uh, again, just pretty much just putting it here for a clear uh, visualization of what's happening and sample inputs that we can actually have. We pretty much uh, put in the issue description. We put in the work item ID that we currently already have. And this will depend on your own ID, of course. And we then look to resolve the issue. So here's a short demo. And let me see if I can play this. So as we can see over here, how this would look like is that this will pretty much be executed uh, locally. And this is a local implementation uh, at the moment that I'll show. So we can see that that's the resolution that is made based on the issue. That's the, what's generated. And if we go to the Azure boards uh, based on our current issue, we can see that the state is set to done. And we can see that the resolution has been added over there. So it's a really great way of being to, able to automate these kinds of workflows to be able to further ease the workloads that you actually have and be able to write just a few lines of a few sentences and pretty much let GPT handle the rest so that you can focus on being able to resolve the issue and not be too worried about the aftermath, which is basically the whole incident reporting documentation. And the better it is trained based on your data, the better this can work. So what I'm showing here is pretty much the default model. And as you can see here, based on the context that I already put in, it was able to uh, 
assume and pretty much able to respond based on this. And as you can see, it's able to get, get a pretty good context and also write the boilerplate stuff. So, you know, like for instance, like you don't want to need to have to write the fact that you've already identified and rectified. You, you've probably already done that. Like we can already assume that you've done that as well anyway. And you already also probably conducted a thorough investigation. So stuff like that is pretty much usually for formalities. But with being able to integrate these into your workflows, you can pretty much just uh, get it done with just a few sentences that you actually need and the details that you actually need to put it. So all in all, it's a great way of being able to have. And as you can see over here, sample resolution, you pretty much, yeah, fix anomaly, for instance, on the home page. You have that, have the description as the context, and just type in the resolution, uh, like a very short resolution. And it pretty much can follow the specific way of how you want to be able to write that and have that as the proposed uh, rectified way of being able to resolve the uh, particular anomaly. So. All in all, a great way. And you can see how this can be built upon. You can integrate this into your uh, own workflows. You can integrate this into your incident management processes. So it's a really great way of being able to build upon. And what I really want to get out, uh, what, you, uh, what I want you to get out of this is pretty much how you can further build on this foundation into your own workflows and further help build the productivity of your teams this way too. And of course, as I mentioned before, just a brief discussion as well on personalizing GPT models for your projects. There's quite a number of things that we can do for this. And as I mentioned before, you can definitely just custom train GPT models too with uh, Azure Machine Learning on your uh, code repositories. Uh, of course, yeah, making, making sure that you are aware of the guidelines as well from Azure while you're doing that and OpenAI, of course, so that you're aware of the data privacy and security implications. Make sure that you're following best practices. I'm not going to be covering that too deeply today because it's not the main purpose of this talk. But uh, yeah, just make sure that you're aware of that. And of course, the advantages that you can gain from this is the ability to have more tailored coding assistance and having more accurate and relevant insights that's provided to you. Because as we saw earlier, what GPT was able to do without me even training it was that it was able to generate a good boilerplate of what needs to be communicated and what an incident resolution normally would sound like when you're trying to communicate such a resolution within an Azure board. So it was able to capture this in a pretty good detail. But you might have certain processes or documentation that some on-call engineers need to follow. And that's when we start looking at fine-tuning models of course, there's going to be expenses that are involved, but it's certainly an important thing to consider as to if you certainly strictly need to follow this, always those processes. You can also, one of the ways that you can also uh, approach this as well is instead of fine tuning it is also try to approach it as well from a way that you can provide the template into the model and pretty much say, yeah, respond in this way, provide the context that way, and it'll follow a certain template basically based on what you're currently doing. So that's one way of also mitigating uh, needing to fine tune the models too. Again, it depends on your customization needs. Aside from that, there's always the AI integration challenges that you have. And just making this slide particularly to talk about these particular challenges and what it means when you start looking into the implementations. Again, just be aware of the data privacy considerations and the model security as well within the Azure ecosystem. There's an, make sure you read the terms of usage of uh, Azure and OpenAI appropriately. Um, ensure that you have the uh, GPT model relevance and accuracy throughout the continuous training, uh, as mentioned with fine tuning, for instance, or making sure that you put, pick the right model. Uh, for instance, in this case, I am picking 3.5 because I want it more fast delivery of insights, but you might want to use GPT-4 as well. Well, I think it goes without saying that 4 will definitely cost a bit more and would definitely take longer to respond. But overall, it certainly would be able to improve the relevance and the accuracy of the models. And just make sure as well that, yeah, you pick the right model based on your own needs. So it's it's very extensible towards what you currently need. And just make sure you do the research into what models you want to implement as part of this. You can also adapt the AI tools as well to evolve to 
towards the yeah, project needs and developer feedback better too. There's going to be continued role of AI within software development. There's going to be a number of things that is going to continue on being a big trend. One of the big things is continually being able to get better performance, be able to be more relevant towards what is being done. And a lot of the great folks at like Microsoft is currently already doing that as well, which is going to be really good. Uh, so it's very important to also consider the advancements within uh, AI models as well, consider what works best for you, and how you can also integrate them is uh, a very important thing. GPT luckily does make it very easy, especially since we now have Azure OpenAI within the Azure environment. It makes it very easy to integrate. Um, same with Op if you call OpenAI's models directly too, it's been very, uh, it's very easy to integrate into your workflows. And there's, a, of course, a growing role as well of um, AI and automating, optimizing development processes. Uh, the ones that we talked about earlier is just one such example. There's a lot more case studies that you can do on it, being able to review code, being able to uh, use it into your own uh, IDEs. There's definitely much more than that. And it's going to continue on becoming an interesting topic moving forward into seeing what new use cases people can bring onto the table. And I do feel that we are in a great place for that. And of course, the potential for AI to personalize development tools and environments. One of the things that I always uh, thought was interesting as well is being able to critically integrate uh, GPT, like what we have currently have into our IDEs, not only for being able to help write code, but also to personalize the experience overall, such as being able to provide recommendations on the IDE experience or how we can better tailor our tools towards uh, specific use cases. Now let's talk a bit about the AI for the software development workflow. So when you look into integrating AI into your DevOps workflow, there's a few considerations that you need to take into the account. So some of these include you need to pretty much experiment with including an extra step into the workflow. Because at times, when we start integrating new things into workflows, it's, uh, if your team is already working with one particular thing, what teams will, of course, prefer have different preferences. Some teams might already are, be using AI in the workflows. Some teams might not feel exactly that it is working. So it's very good to experiment and just see where what teams are thinking of and see how teams are responding towards this extra step that you're taking for instance whether it be an extra uh, pr review process a pr process basically uh, or being able to pretty much just facilitate for better understanding within teams and see how yeah see how people respond towards the automation um, extra check what yeah it also it also depends as well for instance on if you're integrating the uh, Azure boards feature how are they finding it into the resolution are they finding it uh, that people are finding it more easier to solve problems that way are they not finding it too helpful so it's pretty much a continued developer conversation that you'll need to continue having with people and that's going to continue on being a conversation among a lot of organizations that are currently looking into implementing these kinds of approaches into their workflows. And of course, when you look into integrating these kinds of approaches as well, make sure to provide the appropriate resource and training. I think one word that a lot of developers hate is documentation, but I feel like it is a very big thing when we're looking in implementing these processes because we need to continue documenting the different approaches that we can have into integrating AI into our workflows, seeing how people can respond to it, and pretty much having a continuous conversation with your developers. How is this going to work for you? How is this going to uh, be improved further? Because uh, like I mentioned before, the implementation that we discussed earlier is by no means perfect. There's much more ways that we can continue building on it and helping developers achieve their optimal productivity that way through our continued conversations. And of course, some things that we can also think about while we measure success as well is keeping track of key metrics. How are developers performing? How, are, is, how is productivity better being achieved through the tools that we're implementing and what we're currently doing? And 
course, through this, you can also understand the efficiency gains that you can obtain through this. Some metrics that you can measure, for instance, and I always particularly focus on these two, are being able to measure the accuracy and not the quality of the output, and also the developer productivity you can gain from this. So in terms of accuracy, two things that I feel are always good to stress when you're implementing these kinds of approaches are considering the code quality that you currently already are having. So how is this helping your code quality? Is it matching your requirements? Is it matching the expect what you expect? Or is it actually making it worse? And also, what's the bug rate that you have? Have you been seeing AI squash more of the bugs that developers have to solve on a day-to-day -day basis? These are questions that you have to ask in terms of accuracy and quality, in terms of the output that is spewed from your AI models. And aside from that, also in terms of the developer productivity, ask your developers also and ask yourself, how much time is this saving? It's a, it's a very interesting discussion because I've had this discussion a lot with a lot of uh, fellow developers and different managers too. And one of the things I always ask in conversations is, well, how has OpenAI or how has AI since helped you achieve productivity? And I've always gotten differing responses. There's always been a lot of case studies. Some people say, oh yeah, it's been saving me like a lot of time. It's been very beneficial. We've seen developers say good things about it. There's also people that say, oh, it's been saving you probably five minutes a day. So what I've heard from people is very varying. And I've always pretty much continued this conversation as well with a lot of people. And it's, it's a very interesting thing. But make sure to also keep asking that question as you implement these tools. How much time is it really saving? And also, how much tasks are able to be automated by this, is it making our life easier or is it making our life harder? So when you look at these kinds of metrics, it's very important to consider how easy it is to do things and to be able to have productivity being done. Aside from that, there's also some metrics that do contribute to this as well, including integration deployment metrics. So what's the deployment frequency that you need to make after being able to do this? Do you need to do it less or more? And also, lead time as well that you take for uh, being able to deploy these kinds of uh, changes. Aside from that, some things that, other things that I want to highlight is also in terms of performance and efficiency. Understand, these, these are, I'd say, more of an advanced uh, implementation, I'd say, more of advanced metrics. I, I say that because they are not as important as the core metrics that I mentioned just now earlier, which are quality, uh, actors and quality of output and developer activity. Because at the end of the day, we do want to improve the productivity first and foremost while maximizing the quality for code. So these are pretty much, I'd say, miscellaneous. But regardless, when you already achieve a good implementation based on those CI CD pipelines and implementing it in your productivity, these are the next questions to ask. How well is it doing in terms of performance and efficiency? Because at the end of the day, we will slowly see dollar amounts as well be slowly rising based on this. So we need to think about how much resources it is consuming and what's execution time that it is taking. Can we optimize our processes somewhere? Can we make a change somewhere so that we can actually feel that it is consuming less? So these can be in different terms. It can be, for instance, in more optimized code, more optimized performance, or it can also be in perhaps just better prompt engineering because sometimes Sometimes you might be using prompts that are not performing as well or pretty much going beating around the bush than you actually need. So being able to think about how to minimize costs and time is a very important thing. Aside from that, think about the stability and reliability as well. What is the change failure rate? What is the recovery time in certain incidents? And I feel like these, this is definitely an important thing when you consider an incident response and consider being able to uh, work with failures and consider recovery time needed. So these are very important questions to ask as well and very important metrics to measure. Aside from that, we also finally have user and developer satisfaction. This is very linked with developer productivity and it's the continued conversation that you need to have. So continue asking your team, uh, your colleagues, uh, yourself as well, of how are people finding this? Are people getting better satisfaction out of use, these usage of tools? And what's the adoption rate? 
one of the things that I feel is very interesting with implementing these kind of tools is that you will need to approach this from a team by team basis. So some teams, for instance, from your workplace might start to implement it from um, a slow and a slow approach so that you can pretty much use it later on as a proof of concept as something that's working. So that's, I feel, something that has to be measured as well. And I feel this is more probably something to be measured from a managerial perspective, but from a developer perspective, it's probably just understanding more about how well it's really performing and is it worth the investment? Because of course, if you want to further invest into these kinds of uh, approaches, you'll need to be able to pitch these approaches as well. And key metrics are a great way of being able to do that. And of course, that leads us to be able to do AI-driven continuous deployment. So understanding better about how AI can predict deployment issues before they impact production, as we saw before. And our eventual goal is really to be able to prevent you from waking up at 5 a.m. due to production incidents. So why solve issues and have to wake up for it when you can actually have AI to be able to solve it beforehand and pretty much be able to quickly resolve, market as resolved. And because oftentimes the things that wake us up at 5 a.m. is usually just very small, minor issues that probably don't really need to do much uh, with us. And sometimes just a small bug or small configuration change. And being able to have those pipelines, uh, steps in the pipeline to mitigate that into the workflows is a very great way of being able to prevent this from happening. And of course, being able to integrate GPT insights within Azure pipelines is always a great way to be able to ensure that you are able to provide for smarter uh, continuous deployment strategies. So think about these considerations when you are looking into implementing these kinds of tools. And overall, we can then really enhance the developer experience with AI. So be able to provide uh, real-time coding assistance, as mentioned before, uh, but really what will power AI, I feel, over our processes is continued user interactions. Because as mentioned before, for instance, Copilot, um, other tools as well can learn from the way we code, similar to GPT models as well or stuff like that. And it's very important to understand how we can also help the AI to improve based on our interactions and continue further building the model, tuning the model to our expectations, and also building the knowledge of the engineers to be able to interact with these models, whether it be in terms of prompt engineering, uh, be able to generate more op uh, optimized code, and in general, be able to work better with these AI processes, because it's, it's a very big thing that I feel is probably not yet talked about enough. And of course, being able to also have the suggestions integrated within your development tools is also uh, another key focus. That will eventually lead us to talking a bit about collaborative AI, which is how this will look like in terms of from a team collaboration product management perspective. It has a clear role on how it will be able to contribute towards this, because at the end of the day, I feel that tools such as Copilot or tools such as this implementation to CICD pipelines is a very big thing because it really stems from being able to be embedded into your workflows and be able to help you manage these tasks easier and automate such tasks, especially when they're routine in an easier manner too. And we really want to be able to enhance communication and task allocation through the AI insights. So I feel like one of the biggest feature expansions that this kind of implementation can do is also, aside from Azure boards, and we've seen that it's able to generate great stuff on Azure boards and resolve issues easily, is be able to also optimize and build on that to communicate further ways, build documentation. Uh, for instance, uh, if you use, for instance, like Jira, like how we can integrate with Jira as well, how we can integrate this with third-party tools such as Datadog, uh, if you use Datadog, for instance, and be able to communicate this uh, in an easy to understand way, how to communicate incidents in a way that not only engineers can understand, but also those stakeholders that are involved to also understand more easily. And I feel that's really what I want to build out of this, serve as a foundation to build on across. So ethical considerations to think about, as I mentioned before, private security advice is a very important thing, but 
What I want to highlight with this as well is that you need to also consider uh, the community got standards and guidelines for responsible AI development. Um, basically abide by the specific standards that's put forward by Microsoft uh, while using this. And of course, just think about how you're approaching this. So what are some future initiatives? I'd say that it's very important, as I mentioned before, to experiment and continue to learn from different approaches. I feel it's a very, it's still a very early stage at the moment. It's a very experimentative uh, stage of experimenting with these kinds of tools. We've seen a lot of open source technologies on the front currently. I've already experimented with a, quite a number of them, uh, such as uh, tools for creating PRs as well. A lot of them still are a bit wonky, and I think that's really due to the generative nature of AI as well. It's sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, but it's really something that we'll continue to build upon, I'm sure. And the developer community plays a crucial role because of this to be able to generate better tools, share better practices, and in general, further build on the open source community to provide tools that can integrate better with the DevOps CI/CD processes. <laughs> so pretty much wrapping it up, Azure and OpenAI together can enhance DevOps with AI-driven insights and automation with AI being able to predict and mitigate CICD pipeline issues, which in turn uh, boost reliability and efficiency. You can use these particular tools to automate tasks, such as being able to provide uh, alerts to your email directly and be able to uh, offer coding guidance. And of course, you can also choose to fine tune your models, tailoring them towards your specific requirements and being able to get personalized actionable insights, which you can then train upon again to better improve the developer experience that you get from your day to day. You can also get more analytics in terms of being able to improve the deployment strategies and operational monitoring that you can achieve from what you're currently getting out of your AI models. And really at the end of the day, be able to enrich the developer experience with immediate context aware guidance, as we saw earlier with providing AI the right amount of expertise and the right amount of context to be able to answer your questions and automate the overall CI/CD process in an easy to process way. And that's what really, really want to get out of this conversation. And it'll continue being a big conversation to uh, look into. As I mentioned before, it's, there's not really one right approach right now. It's pretty much going to continue on being a matter of what tools you're using, what approaches you're using, and what works with people. And I mean, that's why we're doing this kind of sharing as well to more or less just get more insights and pretty much just learn from each other and being able to develop the developer experience to be able to get a good way of working for everyone. So uh, that is all for me and I'm happy to uh, open the floor for questions. Thank Any you. Questions? Any questions? Probably we can pass the mic. Yeah. So have you implemented any of this in your practice, I mean, in your organization, and uh, what are the key challenges and the experience so far, if you have implemented? Uh, sorry, I had a bit of trouble hearing the first part. You say, how did uh, I? Have you implemented any of the, these concepts I think you had gone through that in your, in your organization? And so I would give an example, firstly, for instance, like on the um, Azure boards example, for instance, like I would say that, uh, as I mentioned before, it certainly, I feel like this is implemented through an extra step in a pipeline. So uh, for instance, in a PR perspective, like uh, start an experiment around with trying to add that extra step into the pipeline, starting with like uh, implementing the uh, check for uh, by like AI, for instance, is like one way of doing things. Aside from that, as I mentioned, it's it's a very experimental stage and by no ways like formal at the moment. It's, it's all very experimental uh, nature, but Another one, uh, for instance, is pretty much, yeah, uh, what we were doing as well with the um, Azure boards, for instance, like trying to remediate issues. It's something that I'm still experimenting with and playing around with as well. So I feel that right now it's just being able to try that extra step, yeah, and pretty much see how that uh, works within the pipeline right now. Uh, but I would say that 
so so yeah, two different things. So yeah, one pipeline and one as an extra step within the incident uh, management process and being able to automate these kinds of recoveries and being able to uh, put the right descriptions and see like how it is able to resolve issues and also provide the appropriate documentation based on what we put through. I would say the main challenges right now is just the generative nature of these kinds of tools and also the considerations of uh, cost as well. Cost probably isn't as much. I would say that uh, it, it also depends, I feel, on like how big you are as well as an organization. But because, yeah, you know, like few few prompts to like yeah, open AI or such like barely cost anything. But like when you start to go into the thousands and a lot of developers are starting to look into it, it starts to uh, build up. So I think really at the end of the day, it's the challenges are how you can optimize your code to be able to uh, provide responses in a uh, good way. And aside from that also is the um, data privacy considerations as well. It's like, how can we approach such, a, uh, make such approaches while considering um, best practices, understanding how we want to integrate this and just really uh, being able to also get alignment across developers, I'd say, because I feel like uh, it's, it's, it's a continuous like uh, approach on being able to experiment. And yeah, I think those pretty much are the, the main um, challenges at the moment. Thank you. Sure. Oh, hold on. I, I'll just get the sock first. <laughs> Perhaps a continuation of the last question, and it might be outside the scope because I know you've tried to focus on applications, I guess, within lifecycle management and, and thing. but uh, you mentioned Python. Are you are you yourself using Python? Um, uh, some of the the Chat GPT support for actually writing Python code. Are you interested if you are, and how you're finding that? Right. So I feel that it is able to. So yeah, I, I feel like uh, what what you're asking is pretty much like how my experience is pretty much with helping it write code. Yeah, uh, in Python. I would say that overall, because uh, of the density of use cases that currently is present within uh, OpenAI for Python, I feel like it is able to generate Python code uh, pretty well, I'd say, like compared to a lot of languages. I, I, I myself like develop in quite a number of languages. I, I pretty much like work yeah, with like yeah, JavaScript, uh, React, a lot of it. I found that uh, development within Python code, it's able to generate pretty good suggestions overall. So I would, yeah, I would I would say that overall I've I've been pretty satisfied with how it's going. It's I feel like it's a continued uh, process of experimentation as well, still for me too. And um, it's same as well. I feel because I, my experience has been also in trying out different models, trying out GPT uh, three point five for some other models as well from other uh, providers of uh, financial models too. But I found that yeah, so far uh, GPT four is able to provide great code. Uh, three point five maybe not as much, but I think that's as expected. But I mean that's that's why we're you know consuming the extra. Um, money for and unlike uh, consumption as well for GPT-4 as well <laughs> anyway for the extra accuracy but yeah I, I do believe that um, with 4 I, it's uh, it's certainly I feel like uh, I've had a great experience with it so far um, and I, yeah, I think you know like uh, it's definitely going to continue developing as well but I do feel that uh, it depends as well on your specific case as well like based if you're wanting to build more towards a certain uh, guidelines for instance for your organization it certainly would work better if you actually did try to provide some extra context or fine tuning based on it. Because I found that, yeah, if you want to generate good code, it has to be quite uh, detailed. You need to provide the specifics uh, of what you want to get out of it. But yeah, I would say that keeping the answer short, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been good for me so far. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Um, and I think uh, Copilot, GitHub Copilot uh, inline completions are still 3.5 and the GitHub Copilot chat is four. So I think that aligns with what you said in terms of quality of completions maybe and suggestions. Yes. So, uh, any other questions? Yeah. All right. Maybe last question and then we'll, uh, we'll let you folks break for lunch. Thank you. Um, I just want to understand that we have talked through the predictive prediction of deployment failures, right? Uh, or the production failures and it requires data deployment 
uh, logs, right? So do you require all the previous deployments or only one deployment uh, logs for it? Are you, uh, sorry, um, let me just uh, re-asking just to make sure. So are you asking if I need, uh, if you will need to require all the previous deployments to train the model or? Uh, yeah, that's right. So I would say that from a CID CD perspective, you uh, yeah, there's there's really true approaches you can put at this. Like you can put this as a completely like fresh model, uh, which is basically uh, sorry, fresh CI/CD approach, which is basically just having one go at it. Or you can also pretty much have the performance of the previous pipelines where to train over. And if you're asking about the the latter, uh, it certainly is the approach that like I'm experimenting with. So pretty much having the past failures to then feed into the uh, GPT again to pretty much like try to solve the previous issue from the previous performance. So so yeah, the answer to that is like, yes, it's pretty much the main approach that uh, I have been trying to take and continually feeding that forward so that it can try to remediate the previous issue because that's how it can capture the history basically based on that and the issues. So the answer, yes. Cool. All right. So, uh, round of applause for Rinaldi, please. Uh, I think you're going to hang around for a little while. So, if anyone's got any other questions, they can come and grab him. Um, so, we do have lunch, which is at the back of this room. Um, so, there's a combination of uh, those who like to eat meat. There's a bunch of those. There's some vegetarian and some gluten free options. So, um, the vegetarian and gluten free ones are there and have marked. If you're not either of those two last categories, uh, leave them for people who are as a starting point. That would be awesome. Uh, and then on, so they're on the back uh, left-hand side of the room as I'm standing, that's the food. There's some drinks on the right-hand side of the room and some water on the left-hand side as well. Uh, start by maybe grabbing uh, a plate and a napkin and just maybe one sub or wrap to start off with because we've obviously got all the folks in the other side of the room. Uh, and then make sure to go and have a chat with uh, Lorian from Arinco. Uh, who are sponsoring lunch today. So uh, even if it's just to say thank you, that would be amazing. Um, if not, um, maybe you want to talk to them about what they do as a Microsoft partner. So once again, Rinaldi, thank you very much. Did you give away those socks? Are they there? Did they uh, go yep. to somebody? Yep. Super, super, super. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Because um, everyone's here for the swag, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Um, lunch is until, because we're technical people, one twenty-five. Um, so I'll probably run around and bang you on the head with a microphone just to let you know that lunch is finished. Um, the next session we have in here is going to be on AKS and eBPF um, with uh, Babu from uh, Mantle Group. And uh, in the other room, uh, the session escapes me off the top of my mind. It'll be, uh, I think it's NGSQL. Um, yes, it is. It'd be the, um, so it's natural language uh, to SQL, um, which is all about using LLMs to generate um, queries natural language. Sam's looking at me, so hopefully I got that session right. No? Oh, excellent. So that's it.